What's cooking, everybody? Dr. Ryan here. We're talking about another hearty topic today. Are you a tixtenosis? As always, we've got a lovely clinical case to get us kicked off. Mrs. Brugada is an 85-year-old former lawyer who presents with several months of worsening dyspnea and exertion and lower extremity edema. On examination, you note a laterally displaced apex and an S4 gallop. <clears throat> she has a grade 3 out of 6 systolic murmur at the base, radiating to the carotid arteries. Now, transthoracic echocardiogram reveals a left ventricular ejection fraction of 25% with global hypokinesis. The calculated aortic valve area is 0.8 square centimeters, OD, uh, quite tight, with a mean gradient of 25 mers mercury. What is the next reasonable step to determine whether Mrs. Brugada would benefit from aortic valve replacement? Is it A, cardiac MRI to evaluate ventricular scar and aortic valve morphology? Is it B, cardiac PET to determine ventricular viability? Is it C, coronary angiography to evaluate for the presence of, of obstructive coronary artery disease? Is it D, dobutamine stress echo or E, right heart cath to document cardiac output and filling pressures? <laughs> Let's get started, guys. Here is a beautiful phonocardiogram courtesy of Mechanisms and Clinical Science. Thanks so much, guys. Depicting the murmur of aortic stenosis. As we can see, first heart sound, second heart sound. We've got your aortic component and your pulmonary component, right? So we've got varying degrees of severity of aortic stenosis depicted. So when it's mild, and we will determine the echocardiographic uh, characteristics of what defines aortic stenosis as mild, moderate, and severe later on. But if it's mild, note that we have an ejection click, which if present, suggests a congenital aortic stenosis. And we got the typical ejection systolic murmur. How will this sound? lap stop lap stop lap stop lap stop Right? If it's moderate, we find that the murmur is going to be slightly longer. So it's not the loudness, it's the length of the murmur that speaks to severity. And the more severe the murmur, or rather the more severe the lesion, the longer the murmur. Alrighty. So here is a nice uh, cartoon depiction of aortic stenosis mentioning the essentials. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Muniz and Al from medcomic.com. So in aortic stenosis, there's narrowing and calcification of the aortic valve, which then results in left ventricular outflow obstruction. And what we appreciate is that beautiful systolic ejection murmur in the right intercostal space. Tests we'll talk about later on, but ECG is going to show left ventricular hypertrophy with ST and T wave changes. Echo is going to check your actual aortic valve structure. It's going to check the orifice and the size. It's going to check the pressure gradient and cardiac cath to assess for CAD and valve area. And of course, complications in include heart failure, well, or rather clinical features include heart failure, angina, syncope, three main causes being calcific disease of a trileaflet valve or calcification of a bicuspid valve or rheumatic valve disease. And how do we intervene? By aortic valve replacement, by TAVR, which is transcatheter aortic valve replacement, balloon valvuloplasty in younger patients uh, or in those who are deemed as poor surgical candidates. Very important point, guys. What is the normal area of the aortic valve? It is 1.5 to 2 square meters. That's normal. Now, in severe AS, if the area is going to be below 1 square centimeter or the valve mean pressure gradient exceeds 50 mls mercury, that's severe. And critical aortic stenosis is even worse, even tighter, where the aortic valve area is below 0.7 square centimeters or the valve pressure gradient is a whopping 70 millimeters mercury and above. Okay, what are the differentials for an ejection systolic murmur? Well, I'm glad you asked. Pulmonic stenosis and hookum hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. What are the clinical findings in pulmonary stenosis? Well, you're going to have a systolic thrill in that pulmonary area. You're going to have a left paraston lift and epigastric pulsation. Why? Because of right ventricular hypertrophy. Alrighty, remember that the right side of the heart handles volume better than pressure. So if you have increased pressure on the right side, it decompensates very quickly. All right. We also note that in the setting of pulmonary stenosis, uh, the pulmonary component of the second heart sound is soft and A2 is actually normal. And you may have wide splitting of the second heart sound because of uh, delayed emptying from the right side of the heart because of the obstruction to outflow on that side. So P2 is going to close later on, which gives you wide splitting of the second heart sound in that area. <clears throat> 
We may have the injection systolic murmur in the pulmonary area, which radiates to the left side of the neck. And the murmur, as we know, is more prominent on inspiration, something we call Carvalho sign. And the apex, however, is normal and not heaving as in aortic stenosis. So these are the definitive clinical characteristics of pulmonary stenosis. What about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? How come? So here we find that the pulse is going to be jerky, all right? And you have a prominent A wave from the jugular venous pulse. There's a double impulse at the apex. Why is it double? Because you have the normal um, apex beat, which indicates ventricular systole, together with a palpable fourth heart sound because of left atrial hypertrophy. You may detect the systolic flow in the left lower parasternal area. And when you're speaking to the patient, they may say, listen, I've got a family history of hokum, or there may have been a history of sudden death in the family, which alludes to hokum. Does the loudness of a murmur indicate severity in the aortic stenosis? And the simple answer is no. And we showed that on the phonocardiogram. That is actually the length of the murmur or prolongation of the murmur that denotes severity. The longer the murmur in systole, the more severe is the stenosis. Uh, so a loud murmur may be associated with mild stenosis. What is the type of pulse that we get in aortic stenosis? It's described as plateau or anacrotic, which is either slow rising, small volume, which is pulses parvus, poor, small volume, or it can be late peaking, which speaks to pulses tardus, tard, like, you know, retard is to, to, to slow something down, to retard it, pulses tardus. So if it's small volume, it's parvus, oh shame. If it's tardus, it's slow, oh shame. Okay, why does anginal pain occur in aortic stenosis? Good question to ask. Because in aortic stenosis, uh, there is left ventricular hypertrophy. And this imposes a greater oxygen demand on your poor ventricular myocardium. And also, at the same time, because of narrowing of the aortic valve orifice, there is a diminished flow through your coronary vessels and diminished um, supply of blood to ventricular myocardium and reduced cardiac output. What are the types of aortic stenosis? There's valvular, subvalvular, supravalvular. Valvular, subvalvular, supravalvular. So valvular often involving the valve cusps. Subvalvular, in which case there's a membranous diaphragm or a fibrous ridge just below the aortic valve. Rarely supravalvular, where there's a narrowing in the ascending aorta or fibrous diaphragm just above the aortic valve. And often this happens, or not really often, but very really rarely in the context of what we call Williams syndrome, where the supravalvular AS is associated with a characteristic face, such as a broad forehead, widely set eyes, and a pointed chin, together with mental retardation and hypercalcemia. Alrighty, what are the clinical presentations of aortic stenosis? Well, some patients come in and they are completely asymptomatic, but that usually is a mild case. Uh, patients complain of breathlessness, mostly on exertion, and we grade that according to the NYHA scale, palpitation, and palpitation, as you know, is married to syncope, syncope during effort, and why do they have this, pray tell? Due to inadequate cardiac output or reflex vasodilation following exercise, or it could be due to a dysrhythmia, both of which is going to cause cerebral hypoperfusion. Angina in 50% of cases with or without concomitant coronary artery disease. Sudden death, probably due to ventricular fibrillation. And in the elderly, aortic stenosis may be associated with complete heart block or our beloved left bundle branch block. Alrighty, what are the complications of aortic stenosis? Well, left ventricular failure, infected with a canidus, albeit not that common, you know, only in around 10% of cases. Sudden death due to ventricular fibrillation, complete heart block, especially in the elderly. Why? Because of calcification of the aortic valve and systemic embolism. Right, key question, everybody. What are the signs that indicate severity of aortic stenosis? Well, the pulse may be low volume or absent, and we spoke of the pulses parvus et tardis, right? There's a presence of a systolic thrill. This, the aortic component of the second heart sound may be absent or soft. A single as to why? Because of impedance to left ventricular outflow, which will result in a delay in left ventricular emptying, so that the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve close at almost the same time, right? There will be a harsh, prolonged murmur with late peaking, reverse splitting of the second heart sound. If there's more severe stenosis, there'll be closing of the aortic valve much later in systole, and the closure of A2 will actually occur after uh, P2, right? Uh, the presence of a fourth heart sound, which speaks to a very rigid, ungiving uh, ventricular myocardium, signs of pulmonary hypertension, presence of left ventricular failure comes in quite late. Okay, what is aortic sclerosis and how do we differentiate that from aortic stenosis? 
So aortic sclerosis simply is the a degenerative disorder characterized by thickening of the aortic valve cusps. It's more common amongst elderly folks and does not produce any obstruction to outflow of blood. Now clinically, how do we differentiate these two entities? So we look at five features, right? The pulse volume, the apex beat, the uh, presence of a thrill, the uh, aortic component of the second heart sound and the ejection systolic murmur. So in aortic stenosis, we know that the pulse is low and slow rising, right? We said this pulse is pulsus parvus latalis, but the pulse is completely normal in aortic sclerosis. In stenosis, the apex speed is heaving, which speaks to pressure overload, but in aortic stenosis, the apex is normal. Uh, must be a thrilla, thrilla noise. That happens in aortic stenosis, but not in aortic sclerosis. The thrill. Uh, the aortic component of the second heart sound is absent or soft in aortic stenosis, whereas normal in aortic sclerosis, and the ejection systolic murmur is present and radiates to the neck in aortic stenosis, but uh, is present, but usually there's no radiation of that beautiful murmur in aortic sclerosis, right? What are the causes of aortic stenosis per age? We split them into three. So among infants, kids, and adolescents, it probably is due to a congenital aortic stenosis or congenital subvalvular or supravalvular flavor. In young adults, are those the middle age, most likely calcification and fibrosis of what is a congenitally bicuspid aortic valve. Amongst the middle age range of the elderly, usually it's senile, senile degenerative aortic stenosis or calcification of the bicuspid aortic valve or really rheumatic aortic stenosis. Please note, when dealing with the elderly, Aortic stenosis is the most common form of, a form of valve disease in old age. It is also a very common cause of angina, syncope, and heart failure. Surgery can be successful in the absence of comorbidity, but the operative uh, mortality is higher. And prognosis, however, is poor in symptomatic patients without surgery. Biological valves are preferable to mechanical valves simply because anticoagulation is not required. How do we investigate aortic stenosis? Good idea to do a chest x-ray, which could be normal in the early cases, but what we will see uh, with stenosis is an enlarged left ventricle and a dilated ascending aorta, together with calcification of that aortic valve from the natural view. Electrocardiogram will show us left ventricular hypertrophy. Ha ha, no surprise there because there's impotence to left ventricular outflow, imposing a pressure load on that left ventricle. There may be complete heart block or our beloved left bundle branch block. We're going to do an echo, preferably a color doppler, because we're going to look at the size of the aortic uh, valve orifice, we're going to determine the pressure gradient across the valve and the characteristics of the left ventricle and the injection fracture. Cardiac catheterization to identify this concomitant coronary artery disease and also to measure that gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta. Coronary arteriography in some cases to exclude coronary artery disease. Alrighty, how do we treat aortic stenosis? Well, it depends on the severity, doesn't it? In mild or asymptomatic cases with a valvular pressure gradient below 50 mils mercury, we're simply going to follow them up with periodic echo and prophylactic penicillin to prevent infective endocarditis, right? If the patient is indeed symptomatic in that they have angina, syncope, or uh, symptoms of heart failure, or if this is a single syncopal attack, you want to go the way of valve replacement. In an asymptomatic patient with severe AS as per echo criteria and a deteriorating ECG, also opt for valve replacement. Don't waste time, guys. If the patient's unfit for surgery, we've got two options. We can do a percutaneous valvuloplasty or a TAVR transcutaneous aortic valve replacement, aortic balloon valvuloplasty if dealing with a congenital AS, and anticoagulation is necessary, of course, if there's associated age of fibrillation or mechanical valve prosthesis. All right, what's the role of an exercise tolerance test in the context of aortic stenosis? We should avoid this thing. If the patient's symptomatic and has angina and has syncope and heart failure, you want to avoid the ETD because that can be actually fatal. Uh, fatal. Uh, however, it can be done in asymptomatic cases who have high-grade AS, but the key word there is asymptomatic. And it may be helpful in determining the role of surgery. Now, speaking of surgery, what are the indications for surgery in aortic stenosis? There's seven of them to mention. All symptomatic patients with angina, syncope, heart failure, angina, syncope, heart failure, angina, syncope, and some heart failure should undergo surgery. If your mean systolic pressure gradient across the aortic valve exceeds 50 millimeters mercury, which implies that the left ventricular systolic pressure exceeds that in aorta, not a good thing. If the valve uh, orifice is less than 0.7 square centimeters, remember the normal size of the aortic valve orifice is 2 to 3 square centimeters. If that is below 0.7, that's critical AS and you need to go to surgery. 
an asymptomatic patient undergoing uh, coronary artery bypass graft or undergoing surgery for any other concomitant of valve disease if the patient has RV dysfunction and marked left ventricular hypertrophy. If you note a progressive decline in your left ventricular ejection fraction below 50%, if the patient has symptoms during an exercise uh, tolerance test or a drop in the blood pressure during the ETT, that should indicate that they need to go to surgery and of course ventricular tachycardia. Ah, nice interesting question here. If a patient with aortic stenosis is having bleeding per rectum, what is going on, everybody? That most likely is due to our beloved Hades syndrome, uh, which indicates angiodysplasia of the colon. Alrighty, so coming back to our clinical case, Mrs. Brigada is quite elderly. She's a former lawyer. Mm, watch out. And she has a laterally displaced apex with S4 gallop. She presents with uh, uh, dyspnea and edema. She has a grade 3 out of 6 ESM. At the aortic area, which radiates upwards, an echo shows an EF of 25% with global hypokinesis, an aortic valve area of 0.8 square centimeters, and a mean gradient of 25 pounds of mercury. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Who are you going to call? Dobutamine stress echocardiography. Remember that what Mrs. Brigada actually has is evidence of this beautiful clinical entity called low gradient, low flow aortic stenosis. Now, con from a conceptual standpoint, the aortic valve area during systole is largely dependent on two things aortic valve morphology, example, a calcific aortic stenosis with restricted leaflet motion. And the second thing that determines uh, the area is ventricular contractile force. Now, even a normal aortic valve is going to open very little if that left ventricle contracts very weakly. So it is difficult to ascertain whether the valve area is low due to either uh, ventricular contractile force, which is diminished, or aortic valve morphology on a resting echo. The echo is not going to tell you much. Therefore, you want to do a dubutamine stress echo, which will help you to differentiate between these two. Okay, now that we're talking about the heart, I want to talk about the heart from a scriptural uh, uh, perspective, right? Uh, Jeremiah poses a good question to us in Jeremiah 17.9. He says, or he asks rather, who can understand the human heart? It is too sick to be healed. Jesus tells us in, uh, in Mark 7 verse 20 through 23 that it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. For from within, from a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and hence defile a person. I pray that we will keep a clean thought life. May our inner life be circumspect by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. Amen. These are my references. I'll see you soon with another video on this channel. God bless you.